Hey all, welcome back to the Real Life Pharmacology Podcast. I am your host, pharmacist Eric Christensen, and I thank you so much for listening today. As always, go check out reallifepharmacology.com. Get your free 31-page PDF on the top 200 drugs. It's a great study guide, uh, no-brainer for those in clinical practice or those going through pharmacology courses. So uh, simply an email will get you access to that. We also get you updates when we've got other uh, new content available as well. All right, let's get into the drug of the day today, and that is Meloxicam. Brand name of this medication is Mobic, and this is an NSAID. Uh, just a quick reminder, NSAID stands for non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. Uh, some of the common NSAIDs, uh, ibuprofen, naproxen, those are over-the-counter and, and uh, probably the two most common that I see in practice, but I do occasionally see Meloxicam. So with that mechanism of being an NSAID, uh, this medication inhibits uh, COX enzymes, and specifically uh, COX-1 and COX-2. That ultimately reduces prostaglandin synthesis, uh, which can lead to uh, a reduction in pain and inflammation. Now, let's talk specifically about meloxicam. Meloxicam tends to prefer COX-2 uh, over COX-1. Now, as you increase doses, that selectivity tends to go away and you get COX-1 and COX-2 inhibition. Um, but what that means is if we've got a little bit of a preference towards COX-2 inhibition, uh, it's probably going to have an adverse effect profile a little bit closer towards something like celecoxib, which is considered uh, even more of a COX-2 selective inhibitor. So when I get to you know adverse effects, I'll definitely touch on that a little bit and how that matters. And if you can remember that and, and then remember the associated side effects with celecoxib as well, um, you can probably tie that to uh, meloxicam a little bit too. Uh, so dosing, uh, it is just once a day, 7.5 to 15 milligrams, and that's due to the longer half-life. I'll, I'll chat about that a little bit on pharmacokinetics coming up here. Uh, so once daily, and then getting into the adverse effects profile, um, it does have a couple of box warnings like most NSAIDs do for cardiovascular events, increasing that risk, as well as uh, GI bleed risks. So, as you can imagine, those are two potential adverse effects. Uh, another one that comes up, certainly something I monitor for in practice, is kidney uh, dysfunction. So, you're going to see a rise in creatinine, potentially, um, if that NSAID is uh, worsening that kidney function. So, that is definitely something that is monitored for patients taking uh, chronic NSAIDs, for sure. Uh, increase in bleed risk, bruising. Uh, these drugs can have some platelet in inhibition type effects, uh, so that is something we definitely look out for. CHF patients, increase in sodium retention, fluid retention, uh, certainly an important adverse effect to monitor there as well. Uh, rarely can have some impacts on blood pressure, and particularly causing blood pressure to go up. Usually this is probably only at higher dosages, but I think it is important to uh, pay attention to that, particularly if you've got a patient that you're trying to start on blood pressure meds or you're trying to get their blood pressure down and you can't do it. Um, that's always a good time to go look at their medication list and say, hey, is one of their medications causing this? And NSAIDs um, can play a potential role in increasing uh, that blood pressure sometimes. Uh, there are some more rare adverse effects, not something I routinely see or worry about in clinical practice um, and, and a couple of precautions. So it is in the uh, insert, I believe, to uh, have careful use in regards to using with ACE inhibitors and ARBs and increasing potassium levels. Can't say that's something I've seen very often in practice, um, but it is a, a warning or precaution there. And in general, when we've got a patient on, you know, let's say an ACE or an ARB or a spironolactone, we're probably going to be monitoring potassium levels anyway. Um, but there is that potential. It has been reported and shown that, that NSAIDs can potentially um, increase that risk there. Uh, and then if you've got a patient that um, 
has aspirin sensitive uh, asthma, uh, that might be a situation too where we'd uh, certainly be a little bit uh, more careful with using an NSAID and not wanting to worsen that situation. Uh, let's talk about monitoring real quick. So uh, the the two major things I think about um, are CBC, platelets, hemoglobin, and then you're probably going to get uh, a BMP as well, which is going to include uh, creatinine. So bleeding risk and um, kidney function are going to be the two most important things uh, that you're going to look at for a patient taking an NSAID. And then getting into the pharmacokinetics. So I mentioned that dosing, uh, usually between 7.5 to 15 milligrams once per day, that is definitely different when you think about some of the other NSAIDs. I mean, ibuprofen you can take, you know, three, four times a day. Um, and that is primarily due to its long half-life. Meloxicam has a substantially long half-life of 15 to, to 22 hours. And so uh, if you've got a patient where you know, they really have a difficult schedule or they can't get a second or third dose in in the day for some reason. Um, Meloxicam does have that advantage of being, you know, primarily a once uh, daily NSAID. So that may be a reason we would select this one over some of the other NSAIDs, which are um, many are two or three times per day at least. So uh, one one potential uh, advantage there that relates to the half-life of the drug. And then from a deactivation standpoint, um, what, what causes this drug to basically stop its effects? Well, that's metabolism. Um, it's not renal elimination. It's not, you know, through the feces or anything like that, at least not to a significant extent. Um, it's primarily SIP uh, meta metabolism and SIP2C9. So uh, talking pharmacogenetics here quickly, if you've got a slow metabolizer at SIP, CYP2C9, uh, that's going to cause concentrations of meloxicam to be higher in that patient because that enzyme isn't breaking it down uh, that quickly if we're a slow metabolizer at that enzyme. So uh, something to think about in a situation where um, maybe we'd need to uh, reduce dose. Same thing if you've got uh, some uh, enzyme inhibitors, for example, CYP2C9 that may cause concentrations to go up too. So, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in uh, the drug interactions section right after a break from our sponsor. If you're in the market for any pharmacist board certification study material like BCPS, ambulatory care, geriatrics, NAPLEX, or others, go check out meded101.com slash store, S-T-O-R-E. We've got a great list of resources there that can definitely help you pass your board exam. So feel free to support that sponsor. We've also got lots of different books for uh, various healthcare professionals. Um, food drug interactions has been popular with the dietitian community. Uh, we've got drug interactions in primary care for those providing care uh, to our patients in that setting and uh, many, many other books as well. So uh, please go check out all those resources, meded101.com slash store. Your purchases there go directly to support this podcast. All right, so wrapping up with drug interactions, I alluded to uh, CYP2C9 inhibitors, that they can increase concentrations of Mobix, so I think that's important to pay attention to. Uh, meloxicam does have some protein binding, uh, so kind of the classic examples of drugs that are highly protein-bound are phenytoin and warfarin. So with that, when you give meloxicam, uh, what that can basically do is uh, kick off warfarin, kick off phenytoin, off these proteins in the bloodstream, and effectively increase the amount of effect that you're going to get from these medications. So um, definitely in those narrow therapeutic index drugs, those highly protein dr protein bound drugs, uh, that's a great example of where we need to pay attention uh, to some of the pharmacokinetic properties and some of the drug interaction properties. Uh, other drug interactions that I uh, pay attention to, so I mentioned monitoring renal function, and that can be especially important in patients taking other uh, drugs that may impair renal function. So diuretics, for example, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, uh, aminoglycosides, you know, even a, a drug like spironolactone. Uh, these are all meds that can 
increase the risk for renal impairment. And you add an NSAID on top of that, and it can make it even worse. So uh, really, really pay attention to that and uh, try to avoid those combinations uh, whenever we can. Uh, GI bleed issues, I think that's kind of a no-brainer. Uh, anticoagulants, antiplatelets, um, drugs that thin the blood, uh, we've got an increased risk of bleeding, and meloxicam can certainly add to that effect. Uh, a couple others I, I did want to uh, at least allude to or mention. Um, alcohol may increase that risk for um, GI toxicity and GI bleeding. Uh, corticosteroids, certainly. So you get somebody on a, a prednisone burst of you know 20 milligrams a day, uh, and ends it on top of that could increase that risk for GI bleeding. Uh, there's probably less robust evidence, um, but SSRIs in combination with an NSAID like meloxicam uh, may have that additive effect as well there. And then last but not least, I wanted to mention lithium. Lithium concentrations can go up on account of meloxicam. So be sure uh, that we're educating our patients and make sure we're aware of that if we're prescribing uh, this NSAID or any other NSAID. So with that, I think that's going to wrap up the podcast for today. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, please do me a huge favor, leave a rating review on iTunes or wherever you're listening. I greatly appreciate that. Uh, support the sponsor, meded101.com slash store. Any purchases there go to directly to support this podcast. So I greatly appreciate that. Any questions, comments, feel free to reach out to me, mededucation101 at gmail.com. And with that, I'm going to sign off for today, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.